Hi, my name is Emily Urquhart and I'm a writer. In the kitchen of my childhood home, there was a small round table where we ate all our meals. It was pushed against the wall and there was room for three people, me, my mother, and my father. My mother and I sat across from each other and my dad sat across from the wall. He sat facing the wall and that was by design because my dad is a visual artist. His name is Tony Urquhart and he had covered the entire wall in a large piece of cork. It ran about five feet across and about four feet tall, so from the wainscoting to the ceiling. And on that corkboard, he had pinned all of his drawings in progress. So at any given time, there were about 45 to 50 drawings pinned on this corkboard. And um, if you ever see any of my dad's drawings, you'll notice that uh, there's a tiny pinprick in each corner of uh, his drawings because they have all lived on the corkboard for some time. So sometimes they would stay up there for a matter of weeks, sometimes they'd stay for a season, and sometimes they would uh, rotate out after a year. And ultimately they would become, uh, you know, the basis for some other piece of art, like maybe one of his large abstract expressionist paintings, or, uh, or one of his sculptures, which are um, very hard to describe without an image, but uh, mostly they are sort of on a boxy pedestal, and it's a cabinet on top that opens up to reveal very bizarre worlds inside. That's the best way I can describe it. And some of the drawings just went on to become finished drawings in of themselves. Now the corkboard had an element of magic to it. When I was a child, my father told me that this is where the good fairy spent her evenings making small changes and adjustments to his drawings. And uh, I imagined her as this tiny winged woman who carried a satchel filled with uh, painting or paintbrushes and, um, and maybe some pencils or fountain pens and that she made these small adjustments to my father's drawings and he would come down the next day to find that something had changed and usually almost, well, always for the better. But the reality of the corkboard is actually no less magical. So what my dad was trying to achieve by having his drawings uh, facing him while he ate was to capitalize on that sort of fertile state of distraction. So uh, when you work out a creative problem, um, you work out a solution when you're not actually facing your task, you're not actually, you know, sculpting or painting or drawing, uh, you, you're just you're thinking of something else. And for me, I, I kind of liken it to that brilliant idea that comes to you when you're kind of elbows deep in the uh, dishwater doing the dishes. Uh, you're not actually at your task. So these brilliant ideas are not necessarily associated with aging, or at least uh, not typically associated with aging. So as my father grew older, he's 86 now, but it, as he grew older into his 80s in particular, people started to refer to him as remarkable because he continued to fill up that corkboard and he continued to make his sculptures and his paintings as he's always done. And uh, I sensed they weren't referring to him as remarkable simply for his talent, which of course is remarkable, but because he was older and he was remaining creative. And I started to wonder why we believed that creativity uh, declined with age. Like, where did that come from? And I'm a researcher, and when I have a question, I have to find out the answer. So I looked into this, and what I found were studies from the 1950s and 60s, sort of seminal studies on creativity. And um, they were done a long time ago, but they are still the basis of a lot of what we read about creativity today. A lot of media articles on creativity will cite these studies. Now, there were a few problems with these studies, one of them being that they really only included white men. So right away, we have um, just taken out a huge portion of our creative society. Another problem that I noticed with these studies was that one in particular, the way it was done is that it was looking at the creative output. So the novels, the uh, paintings, the sculptures, the architectural builds that the creative person had done in five year segments leading up until later in their lives. But I felt that um, this was looking at productivity. And I do know that with aging um, from living with my father, but also from from you know, co corresponding with a number of aging artists, it, it will decline. There are natural challenges that come with aging and that can um, affect your productivity. But that doesn't affect your creativity. 
So I felt that the study immediately put the older artist at a dis disadvantage because the truth is creativity is not a product. Um, it's an action. So you can't quantify the good fairy and what she does. She's grown old with my father, the good fairy, and she's found a new way to help him make art. So the cork board is, is still around and in my, where my father lives now, it's a smaller uh, board than it was in the past. There are maybe 15 drawings where before there would have been closer to 50, but they're no less fine, they're no less beautiful. Uh, his challenges that he's faced with aging has been with memory. So that brilliant sort of lightning bolt idea that I talked about earlier, um, he's finding those are harder to hold on to. So the cork board has a new function now. Um, along with its existing function. And that is that um, he can use it as a reminder. He says the notes are there in the drawings and, and that doesn't change. So the marks that he made and also the marks that the good fairy made, they're all still there for him. So I'm happy to report that creativity as well as the good fairy, they're with us for life. Thank you. <laughs>